Uh, my name is Stig Hagstanda. I work as an enterprise architect at uh, Sykehus Partner HF. Uh, we'll come back to a little bit more what it is. And my colleague wandering aimlessly around in the room is called Jan Stobra. He's also an enterprise architect within Sykehus Partner. So this is the agenda. Uh, we're gonna give you some background, some introduction to our company and where we come from. Uh, we're gonna have a little discussion about what a service actually is. Uh, talk a little bit about architectural artifacts and models, uh, lifecycle management, IT for IT, enterprise and solution architecture, TOGAF, IT for IT, and some lessons learned on a, on a QA. And Rob, are you timing us? Yeah, good. 40 minutes. 40 minutes, ah! Because we did, uh, we did a trial run uh, of this presentation, and I think we talked for over an hour, so we sort of cut down a little bit. Uh, background and introduction. Uh, this is where we come from. Uh, it's the Southeast Regional Health Authority uh, in Norway. It's the blue thing down there. Uh, and we uh, have 11 county healthcare trusts. We support about 25 hospitals. We have 100 psychiatric somatic health care centers, ambulances, pharmacies, whatever. About 77 employees and by far Norway's, Norway's largest IT environment. Uh, our company, uh, Circus Partner at HOF, is a sort of independent subsidiary of this regional health authority, and we're a shared service provider for ICT, HR, logistics into this entire region. About 1,400 employees, and one of the largest IT suppliers in the Nordic countries. Just a quick. This is today's operating rooms, which is sort of where the end customers is, uh, the physicians and the patients. And this is what it actually looks like today. And we're kind of thinking that in 10 years, the ambulance won't come and pick you up, take you to the hospital and put you into this room. The ambulance will actually bring this to your living room. So it's quite exciting what's happening out there. Um, as part of a transition project within the company, uh, there was um, done a lot of work to defining a new strategy for the company. And where's the pointer? What we're going to talk about today is pretty much what's down here. The service orientation as a traversing principle. Uh, put it quite plainly, we had problems delivering to our customers' needs, so there was started a huge transition project to sort of align us more uh, and to be better able to deliver services to the customers. Huge reorganization. Uh, the entire company has been turned upside down uh, and inside out and reorganized. So we now have four business units. One of the one to the right, left for you, is customers and services. And uh, that's supposed to be the business units where you are closest to the customer. You capture the customer's needs. You start planning for on how to deliver what the customer wants and needs. Then we have resource planning and scheduling, uh, which is, well, pretty much what it says. Uh, are we sure we have enough people? Are we sure we have the resources available to start building those services? And then we have service development, which is a business unit which actually do the service development. They run projects, programs, stuff like that. And operations at the end. So this entire organization was built on the plan, build, run paradigm. And uh, these guys you will see uh, a lot of in the presentation. We try to relate uh, both enterprise architecture, the service delivery, uh, the mode of operation to sort of support this through the plan, build, run paradigm. And now it's Jan's turn. <laughs> One part of the uh, reorganization of uh, Suki's partner was that we uh, decided to look for an external partner that will uh, run our infrastructure and uh, will provide end user computing services, network hosting and telecom to us. And um, by basically giving away all everything you can you can touch um, 
uh, we were aware of that we can continue to work before, basically, uh, you could either call it uh, agile or you could call it firefighting. Um, but we, uh, so we had to define what we actually do. And so we started um, building a, a, a functional modem for SIAM, service integration and management, and basically tried to find everything we do, all the functions we need to have to run our business. And we clustered them in, 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 in service integration governance and in, in service integration management, so the daily operation, the daily management of the services and, uh, and the service delivery that, that is delivered either through this partner um, or through internal um, op delivery organizations or actually via the hospitals themselves. And uh, well, we got pretty far finding all these functions, but we couldn't really explain how they um, how they interact, how they interoperate, and how how the how the value uh, how the value chain looks like. What's the value add on in each function? So then uh, we found the the IT for IT reference architecture, the IT for IT standard. Uh, at that time, it wasn't a standard yet, but it was it, it looked very promising. So we took that uh, the status it had then, and uh, we found okay, we have a value chain that where we have all these activities, all these functions, and the IT for IT reference architecture, they, they put them in an order and, they, and they, it defines the relations. And um, the other thing is that we, have a we do a lot of things and uh, we found that the, uh, the, the value streams, the IT for IT reference architecture defines uh, help us to actually grasp what we're doing better and uh, when we go into a certain organizational change uh, initiatives we could uh, we could look at uh, at only one value stream and think okay now we're doing something in the in the in the operations area which is uh, detect to correct or now we're actually working with planning services and uh, and and we're only we are only focusing on this value stream and we're saying, okay, this is, this is a handover to the next value stream. We do not worry about that now. And um, we tried to understand, well, okay, this is actually what we're doing here is architecture. And, um, and how, do, uh, how do these things work together? And how do we, how, again, how do we produce actually value to, how do we actually produce value to our customers? And how we deliver it? And, um, we, uh, the, po the part we, we like most about the infrastructure, about the reference architecture, actually, is actually not all the blue boxes. They're also pretty cool, but what's uh, best is the, uh, is the backbone. And uh, we found out that we don't have one. We have 3,000 applications that we're managing and delivering and that uh, people call, but we don't, we don't, we, we can't have a dialogue with our customers about 3,000 applications because the IT, not even the IT department of the hospitals know that they have them. And um, so uh, we um, started to think of how can we use the concept of the service backbone to, uh, to end up with 3,000 services, uh, 3,000 which are actually applications uh, in, in operations and uh, reduce them to minimum 15 or maximum 25 services uh, that we actually can have a dialogue with our customers about. And those services are functional. And there's those, that's not a service uh, that's uh, um, DIPS, which is our provider of EHR, uh, the patient record system, but that may be patient record system or patient records, actually. And uh, then we have actually, we go into those 3,000 applications on over, we have 15 different applications for patient records. Um, and, and we can have a, a dialogue about these applications. Yep. Um. Just take a quick step back to this one again, because um, IT for IT starts up here with the enterprise architecture component. Where does that come from? Uh, nobody's going to deliver it to you. It's not something that's just out there. You actually have to, this is where you have to start. And one of the interesting thing is when you start talking about service orientation, you suddenly find out that there is no clear unified definition of what a service actually is. Everyone's got their own definition or they don't have one at all. 
So we have secrets partners definition, we have IT for IT definition of what a service is. TOGAF really doesn't have a definition of what a service is. It talks about application services, technology services. Satman doesn't mention services at all. Cobit, Gartner, ITIL, Oasis, Open Group Microservices, they all have different definition of what a service is. So we spent the first six months discussing service orientation and then we suddenly discovered we're not talking about the same thing here. Everybody has their own definition of what a service is. And that makes it kind of hard actually to get anything uh, sens uh, sensible done. So we started thinking, is there another per perspective on how to look at this that can help us create an architect, uh, create an architecture? Because creating an architecture based on these definitions is not trivial, to put it mildly. So we took a look at what are we actually doing? And this is an example from the laboratory services in a hospital where the, um, the question is basically, what is the lab service for the clinicians? Well, for them, it's pretty simple. They take a blood sample, tissue sample, they requ uh, requisition a test, and they want their answers back. That's the physician's and clinician's definition of a lab service. What's the lab service for the people who are actually working on the lab? Well, to them, it's quite important that this stuff works. So they want their analysis equipment to work, their laboratory information management systems to work. That's their perception of a lab service. Then we have the ICT department. What's their definition? What's their uh, perception of the lab service? Well, network, storage, service, applications, and everything uh, that sort of builds up uh, the lab service in, in the infrastructure, that's their perception of what a lab service actually is. So when we're talking about a service, it actually all depends on who the customer is. Your deliveries will change uh, according to the customer. And all of this is jumbled together in something called the lab service. And if you don't know this, if you don't take into account who the customer actually is, you will not be able to build the services that your customer needs. So we've come up with yet another definition of a service. And it's quite simply, a service is what the customer consumes. Very simplistic, simple to understand, uh, but it's, there are some major points in here. Well, it's not a service until you have a customer because you're actually delivering something of value to someone, and if you don't have a customer, you don't deliver anything. The service is defined by the customer. The customer is a consumer of what you provide. You have to know what the customer wants, so <coughs> you actually have to so try to figure out what the customer wants. Uh, another important part is that the customer doesn't own specific costs and risks when you are developing the service. They're consuming a service, building, developing a service. That's our responsibility. We take the risks. We have to, uh, to budget for the development. That doesn't mean the customer doesn't pay for it in the end. They do. And it's an outside in and not an inside out approach to, uh, to, the, um, to the design process because there's no point in building services the customer doesn't want. So you have to reach out to the customer, you have to understand the customer's needs, the requirements to actually start developing some sensible services for them. And huge point at the bottom, this is actually quite easy to, to architect. You know what the customer consumes or you should know. If you don't know, figure it out pretty fast. So, uh, architecture, artifacts, and models. So this is how we view the architecture development world with, uh, with TOGAF and IT for IT. Uh, wrong button. So we're saying we're doing enterprise architecture, and this is the plan phase. So when we, are, as uh, enterprise architects in Circus Partner, uh, are involved with uh, developing a service, we are always in the plan phase. We do not do implementation, but we do it in the plan phase. And then we hand this over to 
the solution architect, and they're the guys that's actually building it. They do all the service changes, they are part of projects, they are part of programs, they are the, uh, the people that actually delivers the service, builds it, and implements it. And at the bottom, uh, on the, still on the run phase or operations, that's a realized service. It is the service uh, as it is realized in your infrastructure uh, at any given time. And the point with these guys is that when you have done a service change, the service actually changes down here. And that has to be a feedback into the enterprise architecture when you start planning your next run of service development. <coughs> and this is some architectural artifacts that we use. What I'm gonna show you now is a very, very simplistic and simple reference architecture for uh, services. This uh, is not the answer to the big question about life, the universe, and everything, which is 42, but it's a very simple reference architecture on how you can start building your enterprise architecture in a simple and easy way. So these are the three artifacts that we need. We need components, which is the smallest configurable managed element. And for those of you who know uh, ITIL, it's a configuration item, it's a CI. Very simple. It's either a person organization, it's a process, technology, it can be a service. Technology can be anything from a thumb drive to a hospital to an ambulance or helicopter, whatever. But these are the smallest components, sort of the physical entities that you can touch and the smallest components that you actually do management on. And we have the capabilities, and it's a TOGAS defini definition. An organization, ability that an organization person or system possesses. And it must have all below. It has to have a person a component, a process component, and a technology co component. It, because it's about somebody doing something on something for someone. So you need all these three. And then at the end, end we have the service, which is what the customer consumes. That's pretty much where the money is. And this is how the model looks. It doesn't have to be much more complica complicated than this to get started. And it will grow and expand over time. And this is from the planning perspective. And when we're talking about planning here, we are, what is, uh, in our case, it's the clinic clinical capabilities that our customers possesses, that their capabilities that we need to build services to support. So, an example of clinical capabilities, if this works, is this one. This is a capability map uh, from, from Ireland, which pretty much lists up more or less all the different clinical capabilities you need to run a healthcare system. So, this is kind of the level we are talking about here. We have your we have the core EHR over here. We have uh, oncology, we have pharmacy systems, we have mental health records. All of these are capabilities that uh, the healthcare system has and that we actually need to build services to support. <coughs> so the question is, you have all these capabilities and then the question is, okay, which services do we need, ICT services, do we need to build to support or to enable those capabilities? Simple question. So, and how do we build services? Yeah, well, we have these components down there, they're ABBs and SBBs, and it's a bit like building Lego. You have a box of components and you take the pieces that you actually need, put them together, and then hopefully suddenly you have a service in here. Yep. <coughs> and so now we're kind of turning it uh, upside down because now we're talking about the delivery perspective. How do we actually deliver this service? Well, at the bottom we still have the components. 
um, all those building blocks, we have put them together to create services, and we have created the services to support our customers' capabilities or the customer-facing service. Well, I've added a couple of attributes down there that has to do with money, because there's always a discussion about how much does the service cost to produce? How much does it cost to deliver that service? And uh, I know management is very interested in this. They're pretty much all about money. Because you can split or you can figure out how much this costs because when you are building something, you are doing service transition, you are developing a service, you are actually building components. You're not building a service. You are building the components necessary to aggregate or orchestrate the services. So your cost of investment will always be on the component layer. <coughs> and then you come to the cost of operation, which is on this layer, because this is where sort of all these components join together and they run in your uh, IT environment. Then you need cost of operations. You need servers, you need cooling, you need staff, you need management, monitoring, and all that stuff, that costs money. So we can add that on the service layer. When you come to the top, where we have a customer-facing service, where we actually have a customer, then you have to start doing governance. You have to start, um, start keeping the systems updated. You have to proactively, hopefully, detect and correct errors and all that stuff. But the point is, you actually don't have governance costs before you have a customer. So the total cost of service is the investment cost on your component layer, the operation cost on your services layer, and the governance cost of your customer-facing service layer, all regulated by service level agreements. So as I said, very simple model. Uh, it's not the answer to everything, but it's a place to start. And it's sort of a place to get some kind of structure into it. And Laboratory revisited. Uh, I mentioned the example from the laboratory service, and I see I have to speak a little bit faster. Because if you have the planning perspective, these are capabilities. So you have the laboratory capability, which consists of the pathology, microbiology, genetics, immuno immunology capabilities, some other capabilities this, uh, down here, and then you have your components at the bottom. From your delivery perspective, Still components, but now they're services. Simp much simpler. So, so why this? Uh, one of the reasons why this is uh, better is that when you build services, you kind of build them monolithic. You start with the service. If you're going to build a pathology service, you, you establish the pathology capability, you build services, you build components in their own silo. With this, you don't have to. With this, you can, if a customer comes, uh, comes along and says, well, we don't have genetics. We don't need it. OK. Then you sort of just disconnect them from the, from the network. You update your service level agreement, and then you're done. What if it's the opposite way around? We don't have genetics, but we need it. OK, start planning on the genetics capability. What more capabilities do we need? OK, we need these two. Which components do we need? And after some planning, you actually figure out we have most of the components. We only have to build this one to aggregate and orchestrate these services. So it gives you much more flexibility on how to deliver services to your customers, and it also gives you much better control over your environment where you're actually developing those services. Because down here, you now know which components that you have to adjust or do development on. Uh, and uh, you also have the dependencies to other services, and be careful not to do too much uh, like that. And your turn. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> so when we look at developing services and planning services, uh, we had to find out that uh, this, is, this is not iterations. We don't, we don't plan a service change, and we 
go into production with the service change and then we look at what happens and we do it again. Actually, we found out that as the services we have uh, exist in several different states at any given time. And so we might have a, 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 a vision for a service in, in our plan phase where they were, of course, we architects are sitting. And then you have a couple of initiatives that are in planning, maybe a couple of proposals that are out at the, at the hospitals and they haven't answered on them yet. And you actually have a few projects that are uh, going on and then you have something, some projects the, the hospitals run without us uh, and, and at some point of time maybe tell us about. And of course you have the services in, in production. And uh, we needed to find a way, or we need to find a way, we haven't done it yet, uh, we need to find a way how to keep track of all these uh, different states. Um, and uh, our and we think that that has to happen in the plan, in the plan phase, right in the beginning of the beginning of the of the value chain, and um, we look at it as a roadmap of a service. So everything that's uh, that's planned, everything that's in product in, in 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 projects, and everything that's in, in operations has its place in the roadmap. And whenever there's a, a new order, when there's a functional request from our customers, then it basically the the roadmap gets updated. And we, um, we think that the, the uh, blueprint, the um, conceptual service blueprint in the reference architecture is, the, is that re what represents the roadmap for us. Whereas the service architecture that's built in the enterprise architecture functional component is the, is the overall uh, target state of the whole of the entire portfolio of services. And um, so this is, basically trying to put this in the picture that we have, uh, we have this, uh, with how we, how we think to do is we trying to use the service cop and the um, community of practice uh, concept where we have a, then uh, a, as an enterprise architect together with a, something you could call a product manager for the service. They team up and they basically build the core of the service cop and they involve everyone inside our organization and maybe even outside organization that, uh, that adds value to the service or that does something with the service. Basically that everybody's on the same page and then we all, everybody knows what's happening. So it's, um, you, could, you could call it situational awareness. And um, um, by that we can, we can keep track of all the functional requirements. We can have a constant dialogue with our, cost, with, with our customers and how, um, how they want and we can, uh, when, they, when they ask us uh, or when they want us to reprioritize, then we can actually go to go and look at the roadmap together with them and say, okay, we can we can delay this delivery and do this delivery first, and we can actually analyze and and and, and, and manage the portfolio. And we think to build up one of those cops for each of the 15 to 25 services. And uh, now I would like to go into the uh, into the uh, enterprise architecture function we, we, we are. And uh, I think there the reference architecture is uh, we interpret it a little differently. And in our, uh, in, the arch, in the reference architecture, the enterprise architecture component is up here, kind of isolated. And actually on, the only thing it's responsible for is the, the service, uh, the, 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 the overall the service architecture. And um, for us, the, in our organization, the enterprise architecture component is, uh, is the same functional, the same function as the service portfolio component. So the architects are also the ones that plan the portfolio. Um, and uh, then we have more architects uh, that do the service design. And then the new organization, we have actually decided to split the architecture uh, community in two parts. One doing enterprise architecture that is planning and uh, the other half doing uh, solution architecture um, that is, and, and working together with the design teams to actually build the solutions. And we, we didn't like the idea or the notion of, of, of splitting um, people because you work how you organize yourself and we thought it was very important to keep the architects together so that everybody is friends and we are on the same page doing things. But we had just had to find out that the rest of the organization would not regard to these guys as enterprise architects that do planning, that do that focus on the function, that focus on the clinical processes, as long 
as they're sitting in the same office as these guys. Um, so we did an organizational split now and we're just gonna have to find out how we wanna work together with these guys uh, in order to, uh, that they basically produce the architecture, the solution architectures that we have depicted in the, in the, in the enterprise architecture. So um, for us, architecture is all about strategy portfolio. It's not only the enterprise architecture component. We think that the entire um, strategy, strategy portfolio value, um, values, value stream is about, uh, is about architecture because you need the target architectures, so they, those are the, the the end state of the architecture as of today. You need uh, to have policies for architecture. You have to have the guidelines in place for, uh, for the solution architects. Um, you, have to, um, do the, you have to contribute to the proposal management because I've, sometimes we have to help prioritizing the task and we have to find out what's, what, what we have to do next. And you have to, do, uh, you have to sit on the portfolio demand component because the architects are often those that actually produce the demand or actually uh, describe the demand. And as I've depicted, we are also um, involved in, in managing the portfolio of services. And um, uh, we're kind of lucky that we had, uh, everyone who attended the presentation right before us, um, um, basically we're continuing <laughs> at that presentation. With one little difference, we're thinking that you run the ADM in each uh, value stream and you run it completely, you take a whole circle. Uh, so we think in, uh, when we do plan for one service or all service, we have, to, uh, do, we have to create the vision, we have to create the architecture in a certain granularity. Uh, we have to uh, decide actually together with the clinicians the right solutions. We have to plan the solutions. We have to basically task our solution architects to build the solution. We have to follow up that they do it. And then the, at the end of the day, we have to update the roadmap of what they did. And then we have to start to cycle again. So we think that in, in strategy portfolio, we run the entire circle. And what happens in the next phase in R2D and R2F, in the, there, there's this, the wheel spins again several times for, uh, for each initiative, for each idea, for everything they do, and it spins and it spins and it spins and it gets detailed and detailed. And uh, every spin could actually create one or more spin-offs, new spins of the, of the ADM. And uh, whenever one spin is done, uh, basically the, the, uh, the, uh, the parent spin can go one step further. So I'm um, just looking at the clock. Uh, uh, it's okay. we, we do a little, uh, uh, one slide on how we do tooling. Uh, for the portfolio management, we, uh, we, a long time ago, we bought a solution that's called True. It's a portfolio management tool. It's, uh, we found out for ourselves that it's not so suitable for actually architecture development, but it's an extremely powerful tool for portfolio management. So when we do, when we, when we analyze the portfolio and try to find out and, and, and catch the requirements, then we use, uh, then we're trying to use true. And when you actually develop architecture, that's what our solution teams do. And then we use uh, Sparks Enterprise Architect uh, for modeling. And we have uh, our resource planning happens in, in CI Clarity. And, uh, and the, when the service is in, uh, in operations, we do, uh, we do it in HP. But that's of course not the truth. We do a lot of other work too. And so uh, we try to map our, our tooling landscape on the, uh, on the IT4 IT reference architecture, which is actually the purpose of the reference architecture, I think. Um, so we found out that we have um, a lot of applications that we use. And we also found out that we have functional components where we don't have applications, where we maybe use uh, a word processing or actually we use paper uh, and, uh, and we're trying to find out oh, how, why do these people not work together properly and why do we have to recreate data? And then we found out, oh, well, because all these systems are not inter interoperable or they're not, we just didn't activate the integration. So um, when, and now we're starting to plan our uh, um, tooling landscape for the entire organization. 
for the entire service management organization uh, uh, according to the IT for IT reference architecture. And uh, so far, we have uh, we have uh, had great success with it. Um, it is kind of hard to get uh, consultants and and the the vendor companies to talk the same to talk the same language, especially those guys here. They're not necessarily better than the others, even if they <laughs> came up with the reference architecture. But we find out once we actually require them to do it, and they ring their people that actually know about it, or they read the standard, then everybody is glad that we actually have a common language to speak uh, tooling, and, and to speak data, in, and speak data integration. So um, for the IT4IT, we have identified a few lessons. We haven't gone so far to call it lessons learned because we actually haven't learned from them yet. Uh, and there's a, we see in the uh, in in for IT for IT we see a value add uh, as that the value streams help us focus on uh, on one area at a time, and we can produce values um, faster when we just focus on one area. It's uh, it's really congenial to understand tooling, the flow of information and uh, and the need for integration. And, the, and actually to find the gaps uh, you have in your tooling landscape. Um, and you can actually use the IT4IT to develop a tooling strategy. The next thing comes actually as a surprise and might be, might be, the, not, uh, it might be a little strange for the tool vendors, but using the functional components actually paves the way for real um, best of breed tooling strategy. Because you can look at each functional component and find out what is the best tool for this functional component. And then you look at the, at the information architecture of the, of the reference architecture and say, okay, how do we integrate this component with the others? And you can, uh, you can define requirements to the tool vendors when you're big enough of an organization, they will develop it. And, um, and you can have a dialogue on what integrations you need to have. Um, and it's very promising to do an actual benchmark of your tooling. Uh, we started an initiative, uh, and such an initiative right now, where we actually went out to the to our benchmarking organization and said, "Okay, go come into our house and look at our old tooling and tell us, uh, according to IT4IT, what we're missing and where our blind spots are." There are a few challenges with the IT4IT reference architecture. For once, it's just as Itil and Togaf looked at as another IT thing. And it's actually not. Even if it's, uh, if the, at least we, want, we don't want to look at it as a as an pure IT thing. I think we can actually use it for uh, organizational development uh, as well as we can use it for, for tooling and then insights and IT. So that led to, as it was ignored during organizational change, so the organizational model based on plan, build, run was not, they didn't come up on it because they looked at the IT40 reference architecture and they didn't quite understand the whole concept around deliver. Um, uh, it turns out that the parallel use of the IT for IT reference architecture and ITIL can be a challenge every once in a while. You have this Highlander problem that, that there can only be one and uh, that works pretty fine as long as you have an incident component and an incident management process. But once you have a process that doesn't quite match on one component, then you have a gap. And it's kind of hard to find the right balance. We made the mistake in the beginning of trying to implement the entire reference architecture and we just had to find out that we have to go one by one. Yeah, two minutes left. Um, lessons, this is lessons learned, not lessons identified. Uh, make sure everybody are in agreement on what a service is and talks about the same things in the same way. And it's actually quite important that you start that early so when you start talking about service orientation, make sure everybody have agreed on what the definition of a service is. Uh, and to follow up a little bit about the point from Jan with, uh, with uh, organization, do not underestimate the need for organizational changes when adopting IT for IT. IT for IT is it's a reference architecture for how to manage IT as a business, but what you're actually doing, you're imposing a set of processes on your entire organization. And people really don't like to change. So make absolutely sure that you sort of address that problem uh, sufficiently. 
I, ha I have this kind of rhetorical question. What do you think is the easiest to change? 30 applications or 3,000 doctors? You go for the applications, trust me. So when you're doing stuff like this, never under underestimate the sort of organizational strain you're actually putting in, uh, into your company. And that is also the, the last point, get executive sponsorship because this will impact the entire uh, organization. If you don't have management with you in this process, it will fail. Very simple. You need, for this to work, you need to get the people on board. And for, to get people on board, somebody in management has to say, this is actually how we're gonna do it. This is not just something that the IT guys have come up with, yet another IT thing. This is actually how we are going to improve our deliveries of services to customers. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>